Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak. I direct the International Security Studies Division at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'd like to welcome you all to another in uh, the Center's ongoing series of meetings on terrorism and homeland security. This is a series that is uh, co-sponsored by Georgetown University Center for Peace and Security Studies, uh, the Council on Global Terrorism, and within the Wilson Center, I work with my colleague Halas Fundiari, who directs our, our Middle East program. Uh, the co-chairs of this series are uh, Bruce Hoffman of Georgetown University, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, and also Justine Rosenthal of the Council on Global Terrorism. Just a uh, word that uh, the uh, audiovisual equipment in this room is sort of affected by Blackberries uh, and other electric uh, devices, so please, as they say, uh, set to uh, uh, vibrate or stun uh, until these proceedings are over and uh, uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, we are being webcast, and uh, uh, this session will be archived on the Wilson Center's our website for subsequent viewing by those who not able, are not able to attend today. Um, we're particularly uh, uh, delighted to be welcoming back to the Woodrow Wilson Center, Stuart Baker. He's, he's been participated in Wilson Center meetings uh, uh, when he was in the private sector um, and uh, is now back uh, speaking in an official capacity uh, on the record as Assistant Secretary for the Office of the Policy Directorate in the Department of Homeland Security. <coughs> he has a long and distinguished career in government as well as in the private sector. He's worked on the, sort of the intersection of national, national security, intelligence, economics, and a variety of positions uh, as General Counsel of the National <coughs> Security Agency. Uh, he served uh, uh, on the President's Export, uh, PECSIA, the President's Export, Coun uh, Export Council Subcommittee on Export Administration. Um, uh, several uh, commissions looking at WMD issues and, and uh, national security and economics issues, et cetera. Uh, and uh, he's also practiced law in Washington, D.C. With, <coughs> with the uh, firm of Steptoe and Johnson. So, uh, we will uh, hear his remarks for about a half hour on, on, on an issue that could not be more topical, uh, thinking strategically about terrorist travel, and that will be followed by, we'll open it up for Q&A and discussion. So, uh, Stuart Baker, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Robert, thank you very much. Really is a pleasure to be here, notwithstanding that the uh, uh, audience uh, uh, distribution makes it look as though this is a uh, bioterrorism talk on <laughs> smallpox. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I really am delighted to be here and, and to have a chance to talk about this topic. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is make sort of some very strategic observations about uh, what we have as a government been doing in the uh, war on terrorism and, uh, and then turn to a puzzle that I think emerges from uh, uh, that very broad overview of uh, uh, where we are. Uh, um, my first observation is uh, is to look at some of the successes that we've had, uh, uh, and we'll start with terrorist telecommunications. Uh, uh, the fact is that uh, um, if a terrorist communicates regularly by uh, uh, telephone or in some other standard fashion, uh, uh, it is. Uh, fundamentally bad for his career and probably for his health. Uh, uh, our ability to uh, track and intercept and uh, uh, act on uh, intelligence based on our uh, telecommunications capabilities has turned out to be a major uh, weapon in the war on terrorism. Um, the terrorists uh, are the ones that survive. This is a little bit like uh, 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 a Darwinian selection process. The ones who survive uh, are the ones who have learned not to use modern telecommunications, and they have substituted for modern telecommunications uh, 12th century techniques. They send couriers with messages, often oral messages. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, if you look at uh, our efforts against terrorist financing, we have also made it bad for uh, terrorists' careers, sometimes for their health, to uh, uh, use modern banking uh, techniques, writing checks, uh, uh, sending money orders, and uh, uh, bank drafts, uh, uh, is not a, a way to prosper and have a long career in, uh, in Al-Qaeda. Um, 
And again, uh, the terrorists that uh, have uh, uh, watched uh, other people be roll up, uh, rolled up uh, uh, have substituted 12th century techniques uh, for modern banking uh, uh, methods. Uh, they send couriers who carry the cash uh, from place to place. So uh, those are, uh, I think, successes. Uh, but they raise a question because the couriers that they're sending out in a 12th century fashion are using 21st century travel. Uh, they are getting on jets and they are moving from country to country. Um, which, when you think about it, is a little odd because uh, if someone is, uh, if a terrorist uh, who doesn't want to be caught uh, is traveling internationally, uh, he's not carrying weapons. He's probably not uh, traveling in a large group of people who can protect him. Uh, instead, he's getting, uh, uh, going into uh, a uh, highly controlled space, getting onto an airplane. When he gets off the airplane, if he's traveled internationally, the first thing he does is present himself to an official of the government. Uh, uh, that official has authorities that are stronger in that circumstance than in almost any other. Certainly in the United States, uh, uh, U.S. officials at the border can ask you any question, can look in your uh, uh, luggage, can inspect your papers, uh, can detain you if they wish. Uh, um, uh, all of those authorities uh, are available to an unarmed terrorist or uh, a terrorist supporter. Uh, and you would think that uh, they would be a reluctance to use travel, certainly as a substitute for other forms of uh, uh, communication and finance. Uh, and yet today, that's what we see. So the question, the strategic question is, why is that and, and how can we change that? How can we change the perception of terrorists that uh, they're safer traveling than they are uh, uh, communicating by telephone? So that's the, that's the strategic uh, puzzle, conundrum, goal that we have for ourselves. Uh, uh, and what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about why that might be and what it is that we can do to make uh, terrorist travel less appealing, more fraught with risk for terrorists. Uh, the, the big problem uh, for governments that want to make uh, terrorist travel uh, difficult is the enormous flood of travelers that they have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, uh, we have more than a million travelers entering the United States every day. It's a million people come in every day, uh, and uh, 87 million of them come by plane. Uh, if you just spent an extra 10 seconds trying to find out a little more about them by asking them one extra question, you'd have lines out the door, flights would be delayed, uh, uh, the system would start to creak under the load. Uh, so, and, and that can't be sensible because 99.99% of the people that are uh, engaged in that travel are people, we not, we not only uh, aren't interested in stopping, we affirmatively want them to come here, feel welcome, move swiftly to their destination with a minimum of hassle. So in the effort to minimize hassle, we can't apply techniques that stop everyone and even ask them one additional question without raising uh, uh, problems for our ability to uh, handle the load. That's also obviously bad for our anti-terrorism uh, uh, strategy if we start making people feel unwelcome or if they get the impression that uh, because we have no other information, we're, we're making snap judgments based on what they look like or what accent they have or where they come from. So in fact, though, uh, we have struggled with this issue. We're responsible for the border. Uh, and we've come up with some techniques that uh, uh, have, on the whole, worked reasonably well at the U.S. border, uh, and they fall into two categories. Uh, the first category is information, and the second category is identity. Um, 
in order to separate the people that we are interested in, in the 0.01 percent, from the 99.99 percent that we're not uh, uh, interested in doing anything other than facilitating the travel of, um, we need information. We need to know who's coming here. Uh, and uh, uh, we have substantially upgraded since September 11 the kinds of information that we get about uh, particularly foreign visitors to the United States. Uh, for most countries, uh, coming to the United States uh, uh, means getting a visa, uh, and our visa procedures have been substantially upgraded so that we get more background information about people uh, prior to giving them a visa, and we can wait until we're satisfied to give them the visa. Um, that plus cooperative <coughs> relationships with uh, uh, the countries uh, where the embassies are located gives us much more information and allows us to be quite selective about who we give the visa to in the first place. Uh, we collect uh, fingerprints and we can use those prints to make a determination about whether we want to let people in. Uh, for most of our visitors, however, they come from countries uh, where visas are not required, uh, Western Europe, uh, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, and the like uh, are countries where we have a visa waiver program. There is no waiver, uh, there is no visa required. Uh, uh, and uh, as, as anyone who reads the uh, headlines knows, uh, uh, those are countries where there are populations uh, that are hostile to the United States, a small number of people, but nonetheless a uh, noticeable uh, a number. Uh, and uh, a, those are populations that al-Qaeda has sought to recruit uh, because they believe it will allow them to evade the controls that we impose through our visa process. So how do we address uh, that problem? Again, with more information. Um, we gather from the airlines uh, information about the passports, uh, date of birth, passport number, other uh, basic uh, biographic information which they obtain from the passport. They get that information from uh, uh, travelers before they get on the plane and they provide that to the United States uh, as a requirement of landing in the United States. We also require them to provide um, re travel reservation data so that we know something about the uh, um, uh, data of the traveler. We know uh, uh, what travel agency he used, what credit card he used, uh, what uh, telephone numbers uh, and uh, traveling companions he may have. Um, this allows us, with that, that combination of information allows us to make decisions while the plane is in the air about how interested we are in which of those travelers. And it allows us to select the 0.01 percent that we're going to ask more questions of uh, and to move the rest of the people through the uh, process quickly. Uh, and that has turned out to be highly uh, 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 successful. Uh, many of you uh, may be familiar with a case that uh, we talked about about a year and a half ago arising from the uh, database we keep on uh, uh, foreign travelers. A uh, fellow who had a visa arrived in Chicago uh, from Jordan uh, named Albania. Uh, he uh, uh, was pulled aside for further questioning because of the uh, uh, conditions of his record, uh, and the, uh, even though he had a valid visa, the uh, uh, CBP officer who uh, interviewed him said, I just didn't think it felt right. Uh, his answers didn't add up. I decided not to admit him, notwithstanding his visa. Uh, took his fingerprints before he uh, um, uh, sent him back to uh, uh, Jordan. Um, those fingerprints turned up about a year and a half later. Uh, on an arm that was still manacled to the steering wheel of what was at that point the largest suicide truck bombing in Iraq. Uh, it killed about 100 plus police recruits uh, in the city of Hilla. Uh, we don't have a, any reason to know what he had in mind when he came to the United States, but we're certainly glad that we had the ability to have enough information to ask questions that led the CBP officer uh, to exclude him. That's the first half of our strategy at the border. 
Second half of our strategy at the border is to make sure that once we have information about people, uh, they don't change their identities. They don't use a fake passport or a uh, stolen passport uh, 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 or uh, some other uh, false ID to get uh, into the country. Um, and there we have been working uh, for five years quite aggressively using, uh, and frankly, taking actions that uh, uh, countries that were more concerned about their tourist trade would not take, threatening to cut off uh, visa waiver uh, status for countries that don't improve the uh, quality and security of their passports. So that now uh, passports uh, that for VWP countries uh, all contain uh, electronic chips that contain substantial amounts of secure information and a number of security features that were not previously uh, uh, contained in the uh, passports, much more difficult to obtain and utilize a stolen passport. We also require and are uh, moving uh, to implement uh, uh, over the last few years and increasingly this year um, lost and stolen passport reporting so that as soon as someone reports that their passport has been stolen and before that can be used to travel to the United States, we get information from the country uh, that issued it saying this is not anymore a uh, passport that should be honored. That's a large part of what we do. The other part that we have uh, done, and again it's about locking in identity, is we have begun taking people's uh, fingerprint scans at the uh, border. We have almost a hundred million uh, fingerprints from travelers uh, who have come to the United States in the last three years. Uh, and uh, those fingerprints allow us to ask the question, is this the same person who came in with this passport last time? Uh, is this really the person that uh, they purport to be? Again, locking in their identity. We have found a, close to 2,500 people um, uh, whose passports did not, in fact, match the identities that they were assuming and whom we would not have found in any other fashion uh, if we were not gathering those fingerprints. Um, I, I would note in passing that uh, um, the newspapers are full of stories of big information technology <laughs> projects uh, that are broke new ground uh, on behalf of government agencies that completely melted down in the process of uh, being implemented. Um, it's worth noting that this is among the most difficult and uh, uh, ambitious government IT programs uh, in the last uh, decade. Uh, it requires that uh, fingerprints be reduced to uh, bits uh, and then transmitted to, to central databases compared to every other fingerprint in that database, which is more than 100 million now, uh, and, uh, uh, and then a match made to determine whether it's the same fingerprint and all of that reported back while the person is exchanging information in the 30 seconds that they spend talking to someone uh, at the primary uh, station uh, where they're interviewed on their way in to pick up their luggage. That's a very demanding uh, uh, IT uh, set of parameters and it happens, that little miracle happens uh, uh, now a hundred million times uh, a year uh, in the United States. Um, so those are the things that we have done to lock down uh, identity and to get the kinds of information we need so that we can use those identities to separate the 99.99% .99 of uh, people that uh, should be moving quickly across the border uh, from the people that we would like to look at more closely. What I'd like to talk a little bit about now, and then we can uh, throw it open for questions, is uh, what's our future strategy? If, if, if that's what we're doing, if we think that the key to this is uh, uh, good information and uh, secure identification, uh, how do we uh, take those methods and move them into other areas that will uh, generalize and make it more <coughs> difficult for uh, um, uh, terrorists to travel worldwide? Uh, how can we make sure that if Albania is traveling to uh, Iraq, uh, uh, he has as much trouble getting in there as uh, if he goes to uh, the United States? Uh, on the question of data, um, I think we're making good progress, uh, mostly leading by example. Uh, 
I told you that we gather airline reservation data and uh, biographic data about travelers coming to the United States from Europe. Um, we think that's very important to have that uh, early warning system. Uh, you probably won't be surprised to hear that the European Union, especially in the wake of the Iraq war debate, which was quite divisive, um, raised serious questions about whether there might be privacy problems with uh, us obtaining information from European airlines about Europeans. Uh, they wanted to know what we were doing with that information, how long we were keeping it, uh, 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 and they had a number of ideas about uh, ways in which it might be abused that we should reassure them on. Uh, and in general, I think we're quite concerned about the uh, uh, the fact that we were gathering this information, and there were threats uh, against European airlines that perhaps they'd be held liable for. Uh, improperly transferring the uh, data to the United States uh, uh, because the United States did not meet European standards of data protection. We ended up having three negotiations with the Europeans over uh, uh, airline reservation data in the space of about four or five years. Um, and I think where we came out is a place that we're quite comfortable with. We did give them reassurances about how we use the data, uh, and we made sure that we could use it in, in every fashion that we considered appropriate for uh, preventing terrorists from reaching the United States. Uh, and we spent a good deal of time justifying uh, the uh, program to skeptical European audiences. The upshot of that is we now have a good long-lasting agreement on how we're going to handle that data, and the European Union has announced that they're going to start a program of gathering airline reservation data on visitors to uh, the European Union. Uh, this is a good thing from our point of view because it means that um, uh, data that uh, uh, we find useful in catching terrorists will now be available to uh, our allies in the fight against terrorism, uh, and that information will give everyone a better picture uh, if someone uses one passport to travel to the United States and a different passport to uh, travel uh, uh, out of uh, Europe to uh, Pakistan, which is good tradecraft if you're a, uh, a terrorist, uh, uh, there will be a record of which uh, uh, passport they used uh, to travel in which direction. And in the long run, uh, if we can find ways to share this information, uh, the fact that they're engaged in this practice will become obvious and uh, will attract further scrutiny. The, um, the other area where we uh, uh, have led by example is in the uh, 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 gathering of finger scans. Um, our program, once people saw that it actually could be done, something about which there was considerable skepticism, uh, uh, other countries that are concerned about uh, the possibility of terrorists or want, who want secure identification for travelers began to explore the possibility of themselves using uh, 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 finger uh, scan systems. Uh, Japan has already now moved to a finger scan system and again, the European uh, 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 Union has announced its support for adopting such a program in Europe. Again, it will be much more difficult than with the international efforts that we've done, uh, that we've uh, entered into with respect to passports, plus our uh, uh, spreading of the uh, 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 gospel of uh, better data about travelers and more secure identification of people used through biometrics, it'd be much more difficult for terrorists to travel around the world and just skip the United States and think they can travel securely elsewhere. <clears throat> That's our broad international strategy. I'll briefly touch on the ways in which we could apply those same lessons inside the United States. Uh, uh, inside the United States, everyone here is familiar with uh, our security measures for uh, uh, for air uh, carriers, uh, and they um, do not rely heavily on information uh, for a variety of reasons. A lot of privacy objections. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was suggested that we shouldn't know anything about the people who get on the planes, and currently, uh, we do not know anything about the people who get on the planes. Uh, we give a list to the airlines of people who should not get on the planes, and the airlines uh, are administering that, uh, that system today. Um, 
The airlines also have, until recently, administered the checking of identity documents at the lines that we're all familiar with at the, uh, at the airports. Um, let me start here with identity, uh, uh, identification and security of identification, and then com come back to data. Um, when we changed over uh, to take responsibility for checking those, uh, those documents, it freed us to do a lot more than the airlines were prepared to do by way of checking uh, to secure documents, uh, to secure identification. Um, I don't know if you've been to the airlines in the last few months, but you probably have noticed that the person who's checking your uh, identification has a magnifying glass uh, uh, or sort of a jeweler's loop looking thing uh, around uh, his or her neck and a little flashlight. Um, uh, both of those uh, are for examining typically the driver's licenses that are presented to identify people uh, uh, and to look for the security features that should be on those uh, licenses uh, or other identity documents. Uh, the flashlight's a blacklight flashlight which will show up uh, a, uh, a, a UV uh, uh, feature that should show up uh, on uh, valid licenses, but which would be omitted from a fake license. Uh, so we are now able, uh, that we have a little more control of the process, to take a little more close look at the identity documents to make sure people are not faking their way past what is, after all, a name-based system uh, that it would be very tempting for people to try to avoid just by changing their name for the flight. Um, it, we you probably also remember that we have been through a fairly uh, high-profile fight uh, uh, over something called the Real ID Act. The Real ID Act uh, uh, provides that states' uh, driver's licenses must meet certain federal security standards. And if they don't meet those standards, uh, then the uh, uh, state licenses may not be accepted for purposes of getting on a plane. You won't be surprised to hear that the uh, governors and state legislatures believe that this is an unfunded mandate uh, and uh, uh, that they're being asked to, they're being regulated in a fashion that requires them to make changes that cost money. They're not getting, in their view, enough money uh, to make those changes, though we have certainly provided uh, m some hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, in assistance to the states. Uh, and it's been quite controversial. And one of the questions that is often raised is, well, why are you punishing states uh, who don't carry out uh, the federal will? Uh, why don't you just pay them to uh, uh, take this action? Uh, and the answer is that we're almost unique among nations in not having a, a federally issued ID that is widely uh, held by uh, uh, citizens. Uh, and so if we're going to ask people to identify themselves, we're going to end up relying 90% of the time on driver's licenses because that's what we all use to identify ourselves. And uh, at the end of the day, the, the judgment Congress reached about uh, uh, state driver's licenses it was if the federal government is going to have to rely on them, it should only rely on those that meet certain security standards. Uh, I, and uh, a state is free, of course, to say I choose not to meet those security standards. But if they do, uh, the federal government ought to have the option of saying, well, then we're going to treat that as not really a good ID. If you don't have a blacklight feature, if you don't have a feature that can be examined uh, under a magnifying glass that will tell us whether it's a forgery, then we shouldn't be accepting it as something that will get people on a plane. So that, again, you can see that our focus on making sure that we have good identification full, uh, you know, flows into a number of uh, policy initiatives that uh, we have ongoing in the department. And then finally, the question of data. We have a lot of data about uh, uh, foreign travelers to, the, to our shores. Uh, uh, we have, at this point, very little data about people who are getting on the planes, uh, to the point where it, it's become uh, uh, widely uh, uh, objected to by people that uh, um, uh, small children, uh, U.S. senators, uh, uh, a number of people are caught up in this name-based uh, system administered by the airlines uh, simply because their name is the name of uh, a uh, terrorist or an alias of a terrorist. Uh, um, 
again, the solution to that problem, the way to separate the U.S. senators and the infants from the people that uh, uh, we're actually looking for, is to have a little bit more data. We don't need as much data as we uh, receive on international travelers, but we don't even uh, currently uh, gather the date of birth of the people uh, who are traveling, uh, even though we typically do know the date of birth of the terrorist suspect that we're looking for. Uh, that's because there have been objections on the part of uh, privacy groups to the idea that uh, a date of birth would, would be put in the hands of the government. Uh, um, we have proposed a rule that would say, why don't we take over the system we're much more likely to run a system, just as we uh, now do with checking IDs, that is focused on security uh, functions and does not require uh, a 24-month rulemaking process to get people to uh, use a black light flashlight. Uh, why don't we take over that process, uh, and uh, why don't we ask people to provide a little bit of additional information? So the proposed rule that's out uh, says that uh, the federal government will administer the uh, uh, domestic flight checking process, the name checking process. We'll also gather the uh, date of birth so that we can dramatically cut down on the numbers of uh, uh, mistaken identities, uh, and again, move as many people as possible, 99.99% through rapidly, and at the same time, focus our attention and our resources on people who uh, uh, ought to have the resources focused on them. So just to recap, that is our, ter our uh, terrorist travel strategy, to take some of the things that have worked well at the border good secure identification, more data about the travelers so that we can separate the people we're interested in from uh, the great mass of travelers. Uh, and to do that, uh, not just at the U.S. border, but uh, uh, to encourage other countries that have concerns about terrorism, and there are very few that don't, uh, to do the same. Uh, and then when people come into the United States to have enough information and enough confidence in the uh, identification uh, to be confident that we can catch people that we're looking for uh, before they get on the plane. That's the uh, uh, strategy, uh, and I'm glad to take some comments. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's begin with Don Wolfensberger, who directs our Congress project here at the Wilson Center. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. One of the things we've heard about now, I guess one of our friends has mentioned they signed up for something where frequent uh, flyers can be expedited through lines by by registering and having, I guess, certain type of uh, identity. I don't know if it's with the eye or fingerprint or what, but how is that program coming, what is the type of recognition, and then corollary to that question, what other types of uh, recognition are you uh, at least considering? Are you looking at the, the eye scans, for instance? There are, uh, there are two things going on in that area um, uh, that I think are interesting. One is there is a now a small um, uh, private industry that offers people identification that is uh, uh, biometrically based, that includes a little bit of background information, certainly more information than that is provided to the U.S. government. And for that, you get a card, I think it's $100. Uh, you get a card that it gives you the privileges that first-class <coughs> travelers generally have, which is typically a separate line. Uh, uh, we, we asked ourselves, if we had more information, would we tell people not to have their bags screened or not to uh, uh, take their shoes off. Uh, and at this stage, I, I, we came to the conclusion that that wouldn't be prudent, that uh, the kind of background check that would be necessary for us to say, okay, take whatever you want on the plane, uh, uh, was uh, going to be too intrusive and, and would have to be too frequently uh, uh, redone. Uh, However, uh, there, there is the, this program, and for frequent travelers, uh, it may well make, uh, uh, make sense. Um, but it's not uh, administered by the government. Uh, the second uh, thing that uh, we are uh, in the process of standing up and that I would recommend to international travelers uh, uh, is uh, Global Entry, which is a program uh, for uh, getting through customs uh, at uh, Dulles and JFK and eventually other air airports. Uh, uh, and this uh, relies on the fact that we now have the fingerprint capability uh, to identify people simply by their fingerprints. And uh, under this program, uh, you provide 
background information. You go through an interview uh, and you provide your fingerprints. Uh, and if you're accepted into the program, which is likely to be a large number of people, when you get to the customs line at Dulles Airport, which you're all probably imagining now and uh, remembering the, the run to be first in line uh, off your uh, plane, uh, if you're like me anyway, uh, a, there will be a separate line with a little uh, uh, platen, and you just put your four fingers on the platen, uh, it recognizes you and you go through without having to wait in the line with the, uh, the folks who have to present their passports and go through the process. Uh, we've just begun, actually I think we may not have yet begun uh, uh, accepting uh, applications, but look for it online. I think uh, later this month we'll begin uh, uh, opening up uh, applications for that. Uh, uh, that will turn out to be a very uh, successful program, I believe. Uh, we're starting it just in a few airports, but uh, uh, that, uh, that's something that we can do because when you leave customs, you're entering into the baggage area typically, and uh, if for some reason we have a late-breaking development that says this person needs to be stopped, we can either have it built into the machine to say, oh, please go uh, check in, there's, there's a message for you or a reason why we want to talk to you, or we can catch you before you leave uh, with your bags. So uh, it allows us to facilitate travel without sacrificing uh, any security, and so we're uh, uh, eager to see how well that works out. Uh, Yona Alexander? Uh -huh. um, I've got a microphone coming here. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Ba Baker. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to also note, uh, if I may, your uh, contribution to the ABA Standing Committee on National Security dealing with this issue. Um, my, my question is um, focusing on travel challenges. Uh, it really depends on the definition of travel because you discussed um, accurately the situation with international travel or domestic travel with the known. My question is, um, the concern that we do have with uh, the illegals or human trafficking, how, how do you deal with that kind of travel? And of course, it's a different dimension. But uh, nevertheless, it is uh, really critical to national global security concerns. Yeah. Um Travel by illegal uh, uh, immigrants or, or human uh, uh, trafficking is a different problem, but in many cases you can use some of the same tools. Uh, for example, uh, uh, looking at reservation data and uh, uh, passport data, um, not long ago we had a, an agent who uh, um, noticed a woman coming in from, I think, the Dominican Republic, uh, and uh, she was bringing with her three, her three children with uh, uh, the birth certificates that accurately stated their uh, uh, ages. Uh, going on vacation, she spent about two weeks there and went home. Uh, came back uh, with her children, uh, re-entered, and uh, the agent, who was suspicious, uh, went back and checked her um, travel records, the reservation data, and noticed that uh, uh, every time she came to the United States, she brought her children, and every time she left, she didn't. Uh, and uh, they realized, they realized that she was engaged in smuggling kids across the, uh, the border uh, uh, by uh, uh, just pretending they were hers. So you can use this data uh, to identify patterns of behavior that you wouldn't otherwise find. And you can imagine how you would use this similarly to identify uh, terrorists. Uh, you provide a lot of information. Uh, unless you're a very good liar, it's very hard to keep that consistent without starting to give away connections to uh, institutions, persons, telephone numbers, what have you, that are tied to uh, radical uh, uh, or terrorist activity. Um, so it's not perfect, but it does give you an ability to start uh, pulling together uh, the story uh, of the person who wants to come in and to see whether it's consistent and what it suggests about their, uh, uh, their past. Other questions? Uh, yes, we'll go for this gentleman next to him. 
Hi, I'm Anthony McKinney. I'm the Director for Public Security at SAP. A question that I have related to, uh, you talked about Japan integrating the, the biometrics. Um, one of the things we're looking at at SAP is how do we get that information across multiple agencies? You, you described earlier the, the ability to share between EU and the U.S., um, but to me it, se it seemed like almost a uh, perspective, of a U.S.-centric perspective of give us the information as opposed to maybe a global repository. So the, the questions I would have would be, one, can, is there a standard, would that be one of the main challenges, making sure we have the right standards to be able to share in that manner, uh, other than, I know you mentioned the, the, the privacy piece. The other part of it is, uh, similar to the smuggling piece, is why not enable other agencies with the need, the data becomes federated, why not let other agencies tap into what they think is relevant, for example, uh, people with TB going across borders and claiming different names. Yeah. Uh, I think those are both good questions. Uh, uh, on the question of uh, U.S.-centric, uh, well, I am U.S.-centric. Uh, uh, my job is to protect the U.S. I, uh, but I, I think the, the days when you could just say, and to hell with the rest of the world are over, uh, if they were ever around. And uh, the idea that you could say, give me the data and I'll, you know, call you if you, there's anything you should know, uh, are also over, right? Uh, we will have to, uh, uh, we will have to find standards, we'll have to find ways that people are satisfied, protect uh, uh, privacy and civil liberties uh, uh, of their citizens as well as ours uh, to share data that will turn out to be difficult, uh, or at least it will be a challenge. Uh, it may require IT tools, and there are plenty of ways to anonymize data. Uh, they're a little more uh, uh, challenging with government IT systems than they might be with a brand new sophisticated banking system, but uh, uh, there certainly are ways to do it, and uh, uh, I am absolutely confident in the current climate we will have to arrive at a reciprocal and uh, privacy protective solution for uh, any data sharing we do with the, the European Union, for example. Um, and uh, now what was your second question? Sorry. Well, why, why don't agencies Oh, why share? don't, I, that's not as big a problem as it once was. Uh, and we certainly do not keep uh, uh, other agencies out of our databases. Uh, the FBI and their uh, uh, terrorist task force, uh, 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 which exists, the, both the Joint Terrorist Task Force uh, nationally and then there's one in every locale, has people uh, in it who have regular daily access to all of these records and uh, uh, it has been useful in a number of investigations. That gentleman there. I'm Brian Beery, I'm a reporter for Europolitics, EU Affairs Daily. Um, on the visa waiver issue, I think President Bush's target timeline is to have all the new countries added um, by the end of 2008. Can you just explain how that's going to happen in terms of rolling out the new electronic uh, system of travel authorization, the new exit s system, and also m a bit of a technical question on the on the ESTA and travel authorization. I believe you can you'll be able to apply for this as soon as you reserve your ticket. Um, now, if you reserve your ticket a, a year in advance, which I think you can, I mean, does that mean you, you'll have your, your ESTA a year before you actually travel to the U.S.? Okay. Um, yeah, this is, this is a, um, a new program that we have put in place as part of our effort to improve the security of the uh, visa waiver program, uh, I, and it falls neatly into the category of wanting to have more and better information about people who are traveling to the United States while at the same time facilitating travel. Uh, what we have uh, uh, proposed, and really what Congress, so we proposed it, Congress adopted it, now we are in the process of negotiating it and rolling it out, uh, um, is a program in which uh, uh, people who want to come to the United States from visa waiver countries 
Um, the fact that they are coming to the United States from a visa waiver country has never meant that they could come anonymously. They always had to provide certain amounts of information. Uh, uh, and one of the ways in which they have provided it is by filling out one of those forms that uh, many of you have seen. Well, you all filled out a slightly different version of it uh, coming into the United States. And it asks you whether you've uh, uh, bought anything outside the United States. What's your uh, name and address? What country are you from? Uh, uh, and um, what's your passport number? Et cetera. Uh, that information, of course, is handwritten on these cards. And if we want to use it, then we have to type it into uh, ourselves uh, and, of course, uh, decipher all of the, the handwriting. Uh, not the most satisfactory uh, approach uh, for us uh, or for all of you. Any, if, is there anybody here who has not had to borrow a pen while uh, flying into the United States? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, what we have proposed is that uh, uh, people uh, fill that form out online before they travel to the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, called the Electronic System of Travel Authorization. It allows people to uh, uh, also know whether they're going to have a problem getting into the country, because it still does happen, even if you're from a visa waiver country, that you might not be admitted to the United States if you've had a prior violation of law, for example. Uh, so it allows people to know whether there are any questions we're going to have or any problems, uh, uh, and then to know whether they're uh, going to uh, when they're going to um, be able to come. Uh, we're trying to do that in a very quick and automated fashion so people will get rapid turnaround in you know, uh, hours, perhaps minutes in most cases. Uh, uh, but to answer your question, uh, if someone makes a reservation a year in advance and wants to fill out a, a, an ESTA at that time, they can do it. Uh, our current uh, plan is for the ESTA uh, validity to be good for uh, two years uh, and to allow people to engage in multiple uh, trips on, uh, with one filled out form. Obviously, if your data changes, you may have to update it. But uh, uh, if you can provide all of that data, then you can uh, uh, travel on it uh, multiple times. Um, Rollout, uh, uh, there are two uh, issues that uh, are associated with uh, uh, rollout. Uh, the first is uh, exit. Uh, uh, we, we gather people's fingerprints on the way in. We don't currently gather them on the way out. The United States has never had a, uh, a system such as the one you'll find in many countries of monitoring departures and requiring people to get their passports stamped through on departure. Uh, and I've, I've heard jokes about the, that suggesting that the U.S. view is, why would you ever want to leave? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in any event, we've never had officials who uh, uh, stand at the border on uh, departure, uh, which means that we don't actually always know who's left, which can be important uh, if they have a 90-day visa, uh, then they should leave within 90 days. And it would be nice to be able to validate that to deal with the problem of illegal immigration by people who overstay their visas, which certainly happens. Uh, Congress uh, wants us to gather that information uh, and wants it to be validated with a biometric fingerprint. Uh, now that it's clear that entry fingerprints work. They want us to gather them on the departure and use the fingerprints to match identities. Um, uh, we will lose our ability to um, uh, liberalize the visa waiver program and admit some of our friends from Eastern Europe and uh, Korea uh, if we do not implement a departure biometric program by July of 2009. Um, we have proposed a regulation that would do that, but it would not invent a core of border guards uh, who are checking people's ID on the way out. Instead, it would build on a system that we already have in which airlines uh, are currently reporting to us on the contents of the passports of people who leave. Uh, we would ask them at the same time that they do that to gather the fingerprints uh, on a relatively, you know, as these things go, inexpensive device that, uh, and just collect it and send it to us every 24 hours. We've proposed that in a rule. Uh, I, we're taking comment on it now. You won't be surprised to hear that uh, the airlines uh, not enthusiastic about this idea uh, and have suggested that we, we should do it and, and save them uh, the trouble. I, I question whether they'd really be happy with that system, frankly, because then we would have to delay flights while 
our uh, uniformed uh, uh, border departure uh, verifiers moved from flight to flight to gather the biometrics. Uh, I think that would be worse for industry, uh, and I'm hoping that when they think about this, they will conclude that given the, the fact that we have a statutory mandate, uh, uh, we just, you know, somebody's got to do it. The least expensive way to do it is to have the airlines do it. Uh, so that's uh, what we're currently uh, 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 taking comment on, and we hope to get that rule in place by the end of the year. The rollout for ESTA? Uh, the rollout for ESTA, uh, the, the statute requires that it be fully operational uh, for us to start admitting uh, uh, countries to the program, and so we uh, expect to be uh, uh, implementing <coughs> ESTA this year. I promised uh, Mr. Baker we would get him out in time for his next appointment. Let me just uh, conclude by uh, with a comment and, and, a, and a final question. The comment is that this pre your, your remarks today are very much of a kind uh, with other presentations we've had in this series. And as a lawyer, I, maybe you, I think you're well positioned to kind of make and appreciate this point that uh, often kind of in the uh, literature on terrorism or even the political discourse, people throw up their hands and say, well, these are non-state actors, they're undeterrable, you can't control them, et cetera. But your remarks bring out just how much leverage we can get through a sound national, uh, a sort of a sound national and international legal basis that terrorists may be non-state actors, but they don't exist outside the solar system or off this planet. Wherever they are, they're in a state. And we, got, we have, through body of laws, lots of leverage in dealing with that, those types of problems. It doesn't end it, but uh, your remarks brought out how much leverage we can get from it, which leads me to, to kind of my final question, and it's sort of, I guess, just under the rubric of challenges that I'm sure are on your radar scope, is you started off by saying basically uh, that, that terrorists are rational actors, that uh, when you make uh, transferring money difficult or communicating, they sort of shift modes. And uh, you've taken us through all the methods. Uh, anyone on webcast uh, sitting wherever working for al-Qaeda listening to those webcasts say, we are not going to try to get into the United States for all the reasons that you just outlined. So what kind of like from the sort of plaintiff from al-Qaeda's side or, or like organizations, what what will these sets of moves, where will that push them? I mean, the obvious one seems to be, and picking up on Jonah's comment, uh, is the, the southern border, you know, uh, we have a kind of illegal immigration problem. Have there been any instances where you, people have actually been picked up trying to get visas to go into, say, Mexico or Central America, viewing that as sort of a soft way into this country? And, you know, maybe it's not in your portfolio, but how is, how is within DHS and like in the affiliate agencies, how are you thinking through those problems? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say that uh, if they follow the approach of uh, uh, shifting to the 12th century, that uh, uh, techniques that uh, we'll have to start working on uh, mule detection systems for uh, uh, terrorist travelers. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we, do, we do have concerns about the land borders. Uh, they're different uh, but very real on both uh, uh, borders. Uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, capturing people at the uh, uh, southern border is a challenge. We capture a lot of people. Many of the people we capture, we capture two, mm -hmm. three, four, five times. Uh, and return them uh, to Mexico where they come from, and uh, so there's not a lot of deterrence in that. Obviously, if we care, capture a Libyan, we only capture him once. Uh, it, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's not a picnic coming across that border. I, uh, I, the uh, northern border, we face a different uh, problem in that the border is very open. Uh, the people who live along that border on both sides of it are strongly committed to keeping it as open as possible and exquisitely sensitive to anything that slows people down by, as I said, you stop and ask another question, uh, pretty soon the line is across the bridge. Uh, and so we need good data uh, and we need to secure identities of people who are coming across uh, our land border. Uh, we have had, and this is one thing I regret, we were ready to implement this year a program that would say if you're going to come across the border from Canada, you need a passport, a good secure document that identifies you in a, com in a way that is comfortable uh, uh, to us. Uh, uh, currently, you do not need a passport. Uh, uh, and uh, Congress has postponed the date on which that uh, requirement can be finally imposed uh, uh, until June of 2009. Uh, 
Uh, we have done a number of things that are steps toward that. You can't fly to the United States from Canada or elsewhere uh, without a passport. Uh, you can't come across the border. Uh, uh, that's something we did about a year ago. Um, in the last three months, we abolished a remarkable uh, practice that allowed you to come across the border if you had a, a nice smile and a good line of patter. You didn't have to have a document at all. I, if you could persuade the uh, uh, border agent that uh, you should be let in, then they would just let you in. Uh, we wanted to move to a situation in which we actually had real government-issued uh, documents and a limited number that could be validated right at the spot. Uh, uh, and because of concerns about border delays, uh, Congress has postponed that. Uh, there's a significant exposure. There's plenty of people in Canada, uh, just as there, there are people in the United States, who uh, are hostile to our policies and to our government and to our people and uh, uh, who would like to come across and do us harm. And we'd like to be able to keep track of them. We'd like them not to be able to pretend to be somebody else. Uh, we're not yet there, but uh, I think we will get there in June of 2009. Don, did you have a comment on that? Just the, on. Yeah, on the congressional piece. I think just go ahead and speak up. All right. Uh, our ambassador to El Salvador told us uh, last week, week before, that a lot of Iranians are taking out citizenship in Nicaragua. Do you know what that's all about? No, I, I, I don't. Uh, we obviously are concerned about uh, uh, the uh, passport and citizenship practices of any country where it would allow people to uh, evade the, uh, 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 the identification systems that we use. Uh, um, we have a gen generally a good cooperative relationship with most Central American countries. Nicaragua is maybe a little bit more of a challenge than some of the others right now. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking 